productivity. Creativity is interesting because it kills our creativity, but there's also a little bit of creative brilliance that comes when the decision-making center shuts down. So there's a little bit of benefit to creativity, but not enough to offset the other benefits. Although if you really need a good idea, staying up to 3 a.m. might not be the worst idea if you don't need to be productive and act on it afterwards. It in adversely impacts weight, it affects our mood, enough said, and then it just has long-term health implications when we do not get enough sleep. So what I wanna focus on today really is getting into the what you can do about it, because that's the most important part for me is to be able to act. That's my philosophy with every client I work with, every one of my life hacking events is like, how can I walk out of the room and apply it today? That's what I care about. <clears throat> so the way to understand, or a way to understand sleep and a method that in to give you kind of a framework to work from is this idea that we have these two different hormones that really kind of control sleep. It's not that simple, but this is a good framework to start with. We have cortisol, which you've probably all heard of, and then we have melatonin, which you've likely all already heard of. So most of us know cortisol as the stress hormone. It's that thing that you know keeps us up at night. You've heard about cortisol makes us fat. Well, it also has, and so cortisol is evil, 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 except that it's not. We actually have to have cortisol. It's also, it's responsible for waking us up in the morning. So if you look here at the chart, you can see the orange graph. It's a two-day chart of our cortisol rhythms is the orange one. So you see here cortisol, it spikes in the morning around 6 a.m., and then it comes down through the course of the day. And so we need to have nice low cortisol levels to go to sleep. And then it comes back up overnight. It's what wakes us up in the morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Conversely, we've got melatonin. Melatonin is the kind of the antagonist to cortisol, if you will, in this scenario. Melatonin is what we heard of. It's what we, the hormone that we need to go to sleep. So melatonin works on an opposite cycle <clears throat> around uh, around the morning, it's the lowest, and then it starts climbing around dinner time, and then it goes all the way up till about midnight where it peaks, and it comes down in the peaks and valleys. So the only reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to think as we go forward talking about all these different hacks. The reason that we're doing each of these is because I'm trying to influence either your cortisol level or your melatonin level so that we can kind of readjust our body to get into those rhythms. So there's probably gonna be seven or eight different hacks that we're gonna walk through today. And so as you go through, think about which, I'm gonna ask you at the end to pick two that you aren't doing, and then apply those. That's gonna be your 30 day challenge to apply two of the ones that you're not doing and see how much better you feel at the end of 30 days. <clears throat> So in general, we have about three sort of general pathways to manage those hormones. The first is that we have our pre-bed rituals. What is it that we do in the one to two hours before bed that can positively influence our sleep? There's actually quite a few of them. Some of them you probably know about. I'm gonna give you a little bit of the why it's important and then maybe give you a couple you don't know about. What do we do once we're in the room? And then we have the lifestyle changes. The lifestyle changes are really important foundational steps but they're not what's gonna give you the results in the 30 days. I hate to say that because I think they're super important, but I also want you to win in 30 days. <clears throat> so the first thing is to create the ritual. And step one of creating a ritual is to create a ritual. And the reason that we wanna have ritual is because the brain is predictive. It likes to know what's coming next. If you sort of settle into your routine that 90 minutes before bedtime, you put on your jammies, you grab a book, you climb into bed, the temperature in the house starts cooling down, all those things. It tells the brain, hey, sleep is coming next. So the body starts self-regulating, those hormones sort of start taking care of themselves. And what we know about sleep research is that sleep is highly individual, as you all already are painfully familiar with, and the number one predictor of, sleep of how well people sleep has to do with their sleep hygiene or the sleep habits that they've created. So from the uh, Carlson School of Management, what they say is rituals enhance the enjoyment of consumption because of the greater involvement in the experience that they prompt. Now, I have to admit, this study was about chocolate, not making that up, but I still think it's important and it's relevant here. <clears throat> so one of the um, best things that you could ever do to affect your sleep quality is get some of these amber colored glasses. Not only do you get to look like Bono, and who wouldn't want to look like Bono, but you end up helping um, help block out the light uh, waves that it, to suppress your melatonin. So what they found is we already know, we've probably heard about the electronics and how they impact sleep. Well, our regular lighting does too. 
And because nobody is ever going to, <clears throat> excuse me, nobody's ever going to just go off the grid and starting at 7 p.m. stop, you know, power off their house, we need to have some other mechanisms in place. So as the slide mentions, normal room light will still disrupt your sleep. So we've got these amber glasses. I've got two different um, brands here. You can get them both on Amazon. At the very end, I've got a slide that um, gives you a link to my website that has all of these references for you if you ever want to go back in. I'm going to mention a couple of other products throughout that will also be linked to on that website. So if you want to capture with a screenshot, write it down, whatever, but you'll also get a link to those references. So as the quote mentions, the Amber Lens Group experienced significant improvement in sleep quality relative to the control group and a more positive effect. Mood also improved significantly relative to controls. If you were going to pick one hack that you're not doing and you don't mind looking for Bono a couple hours before bedtime, I would probably say start here. <clears throat> the next one is no electronics, which I also know you're not going to do. So <laughs> that is why the Amber Goggles are your, is your greatest, pre your best friend. Um, but if you are going to stay on the electronics, the one thing I would say is pick something boring to do. I'm a huge Doctor Who fan, and it's not just because David Tennant is cute. But I love the show, but what it does is it amps me up. And I get done watching a show, and it takes me two hours to fall back asleep because there's so much mental stimulation, so many visuals, so many cool special effects that it just takes me a while to unwind. So what I've learned instead, what I'm much better off doing is sitting and reading. I read the newspaper, to be honest, online. I get caught up in my Google Reader. I troll Facebook because I clearly have nothing better to do. But I do stuff that's going to help me downregulate and help me turn my brain off for a couple of hours. <clears throat> the next one is no caffeine or alcohol. We already know about caffeine. I'm not going to spend time here. Alcohol is frankly a bit of a mixed bag. What the research will tell you is that one drink, it's okay. Once you get above one, then it starts disrupting your sleep. It's going to help you go to sleep faster, but as your body processes the toxins, because that's what alcohol is, it's a toxin, is your body processes it, it's actually going to wake you up a couple hours later. I know if I have two or three glasses of wine, I fall right asleep, but four hours later I'm laying there. What's going on? Who can I talk to? So as the study indicates, low doses of alcohol may partially improve sleep, but there are reductions in slow wave activity and disturbances in REM sleep. So careful with the alcohol. Um, and then with regards to food, my clients ask me about this all the time. There's no science to really say that I've been able to find as to what food you should eat before bed or not. Um, so I found a couple of random studies, but there just isn't a lot out there. Everything that, as far as I know, is anecdotal. So if you've, whatever you've heard, make sure you eat fat, make sure you eat protein, make sure you eat carbs. We don't know. The science just doesn't seem to bear out any of those. <clears throat> and then the last pre-bed ritual, part of your pre-game warm-up, if you will, being Super Bowl weekend, is that our bodies work through this, um, this temperature cycle. If you look, first thing in the morning, we wake up, we're about 97.6 degrees. Then we go up to about 99, so our body temperature comes up around lunchtime. So right around now, we're really at our peak body temp activity level. And then throughout the day, it drops. And around midnight or so, we hit our low. So one of the things that we can do to help lower our body temperature is actually take a hot bath. I get it, hot baths warm us up, but the minute we come, come out, boom, body temperature drops, we're ready for bed. I actually theorize now that this is why we give little kids warm baths before bed, helps them sleep. <clears throat> but what they say here is the core body temperature measure of insomniacs was significantly higher than good sleepers. That's one study, but there are dozens more that indicate that this is another great technique for you to, to undertake in order to help you get to sleep faster. So that's kind of the pre-game rituals. Um, does anybody have any questions? I love questions. I love talking. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to in the room next. <clears throat> magnesium. Magnesium, great question. Um, magnesium actually has been proven, so this is an interesting one, it's been proven to have a limited effect. And the effect on sleep primarily seems to come in for those people that are deficient in magnesium. But what we also know is the vast majority of people are deficient in magnesium. So it doesn't have any magical effects on sleep per se, but as soon as you start making, taking magnesium, you make your body just that much better all the way through. 
I have to believe, I can't, I won't have the data to back it up, but that because we get our body sort of regu self-regulating better through increased magnesium, which does have 300 distinct uses in the body, that you are going to start regulating those hormones better. <clears throat> yeah. What about bedtime? <clears throat> bedtime. Getting to that in a couple minutes, but yes, a steady schedule is critically important in terms of, um, in terms of improving sleep quality. Melatonin supplementation has actually not been proven to work. <clears throat> so, yeah. And if you guys were here, I saw there's a supplement talk this morning that I didn't get into. But, okay, that was your talk? Yeah. Okay, so then you know that it's, supplements aren't really regulated anyhow, so I tend to be on the wary side. But, <clears throat> um, okay. So, uh, moving on to in the room, a couple of quick tips for you while you're actually in your room getting ready for bed. I mentioned the, the impact that light has on keeping you awake at night. It's a profound impact. Your best bet is going to come if you can put up, well, curtains. Let's just start with curtains. Something like 40% of Americans apparently don't have curtains in their bedroom. This is an astounding number to me. So if you're one of those 40%, and odds are some of you are, I would start with the curtains. Because um, you really want to have a dark room. The darker, the better. What they have found is that even low levels of light kind of constantly through the night still have an impact on sleep. So you can, lux is kind of the measurement that they use for light. So say a thousand lux light, if you're exposed to that for an hour, the 500 lux light, which is half as bright for twice as long, has the same impact. So imagine if you have kind of that light pollution from the street just sort of tr trickling into your room all night long, that is going to adversely impact your ability to sleep at night. Um, I would also suggest taking anything with a digital readout and putting it out of your, out of your direct line of sight. Um, not only does the light bother you, but for me, if I roll over and go, crap, it's been two hours, <laughs> it causes me a great deal of stress. <clears throat> The next one is the cool room. I talked about cooling your body temperature, but also making sure you have a cool room. And if you were gonna pick another hack that you're not doing, I would probably go here. This is great use of a programmable thermostat. If you don't have one in your house or your apartment, they're not that expensive. Um, the ideal ambient temperature for sleeping is between 60 and 67 degrees. Anything below 54 and 75 is definitively detrimental, so then there's a little bit of a gap in there, but 60 to 67 is what most of the research indicates. Now, I know that if you have a partner of some sort that you have to share a room with, that maybe you guys don't necessarily agree on a sleeping temperature, and I totally get that. And so do other people, because there are products for this. So the company Sheeks, S-H-E-E-X, has actually developed wicking sheets and pillows and performance sleepwear, and I kid you not. I don't want to think too much about what that means, but they have performance sleepwear on their website. The other thing that's available that I've read really good things about, but I don't have a problem sleeping, is uh, uh, these gel mats, chill gels, chili pads. If you're familiar with the Thermarest that we use for camping, it's the same sort of idea. It literally is just sort of this pad that it, with, that's cool, so you can have, your partner can go and be as comfortable as you want, you can sleep on the chill pad, and then therefore you guys can sort of independently maintain temperature while even in the same bed. <clears throat> and as the Journal of Physiological Anthropology states, the thermal environment is one of the most important factors that can affect human sleep. So again, if you're going to pick another hack, I would give serious consideration to working on the cool room aspect of stuff. <clears throat> of cooling the head instead of the entire body. No, I have not. <clears throat> Interesting. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing. So I do know that when you cool the core body temp, you want to increase the temperature of the distal, which is why, like, for example, a hot water bottle at the foot of the bed can also make a big difference. Or in my case, I put on socks. Um, so something else that can also. But that's great. Thank you. So the last in the room technique is doing some relaxation exercises. If you remember that one of our goals is to get that cortisol level to come back down, cortisol is tied to stress. If we go to bed really amped up, you're up working too late, you're thinking about a lot of stuff, we really want to make sure that we're trying to manage our stress levels the best we can. I put counting sheep up there, and it's not actually a joke. <laughs> um, what the counting sheep does is you're focusing on something else besides what's going on at work. The lights go out, the first thing you do is you start thinking about all the crap that's going on in your life. 
by counting sheep or some sort of breathing or some sort of focused meditation, you have to focus on that instead of the rest of your life. So that will start calming you down to help bring those cortisol levels down. The next one is head to toe muscle relaxation. Again, exactly what it sounds like. Because of our fight, flight, or freeze, which is our stress response, of which cortisol is part of that, muscle contraction is a natural part of that process. So if we're laying there with our legs really tight or our jaw really tight, what we're doing is that we're actually sending adrenaline and cortisol through our bodies. So taking time to sort of consciously do a head to toe muscle check will help as well. And then I have list listed the jaw specifically because that tends to be a place where everybody holds a ton of stress. So even if doing the head to toe things feels a little too woo woo for you, just check the jaw. <clears throat> and then last but not least, I wanna finish up the lifestyle changes. As I mentioned, these are not gonna be your 30 day quick wins, but um, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise program which is really what the kind of experts say we should be doing from an exercise standpoint anyhow, will make a positive difference, but all the studies say that it takes about 10 to 16 weeks to see results. Again, since this is a lifelong journey for us, that's not forever, but if you want to win in the next 30 days, which I want you to, then picking exercise as one of your habits is not gonna get you there. And then last but not least is schedule. As I said when we started, the body and the brain thrive on prediction. It loves to know what's going on. So keeping a consistent schedule is really, really important for us as much as possible, get to bed at the same time, get ourselves up at the same time. Science also shows that seven to nine hours is what we typically want to shoot for. I know that's really difficult for some people, but that is what all of the studies say. I was actually just reading a study over lunch today that said that less than that is tied to depression. A brand new study just came out, like literally this morning that talked about that. Um, and then also, the other thing I would say is work with your body's natural rhythms. I'm a natural night owl. I am never gonna be a 4 a.m. type of person. I have friends that are, God bless them. Um, and so I don't try to fight it, but just know, you know what, I'm happier when I get up at eight and I go to bed at midnight and so be it. But then just work with that, but then keep that eight to, that midnight to eight shift as often as you can. Then that's gonna make a huge difference in terms of helping your body adapt. <clears throat> so on to my challenge for you. I've got a 30 day challenge for you. So <clears throat> if you're up to trying to take the sleep challenge, I'd love to have you start with these pre and post assessments. It's called the P Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. This is, it sounds really daunting, it's not, it's a couple of pages of checkboxes. But this is how you're gonna get a baseline for where you're at in overall sleep quality. This is kind of the, the standard that they use in all the major sleep research. I've got a link to it again on my website. And then, so we'll do one to start, ideally today or tomorrow if you're gonna take the challenge or next week on our work on it day. You're gonna pick your first habit that we walked through. You're gonna do that for 30 days. I want you to not start the second habit until two weeks in to make sure you've got that first habit nailed. Then pick that second habit, whatever it is, if it's the cool room, it's the glasses, it's whatever. And then also, because I'm also a data geek, much like James, I love being able to track how it's going day to day. So keep a daily sleep journal. Um, I think it was Alex talked about the sleep apps earlier that you can use if you're using you know, your Fitbit, if you've got Sleep Cycle, if you've got an old school Zeo, whatever you have, there's tons of apps and devices out there. I did not recommend necessarily an app or device, because I know some people don't want any electronics in the bedroom and they don't want to sleep with their phone next to them. So I also say paper is a perfectly viable option. I actually track that stuff in my, I have an Evernote folder for it, which is a great place as well. <clears throat> and that's it, I suspect we're out of time. Um, but I'm around the rest of the day. If you have any questions, I'll probably be here next Saturday. All of these sleep references are here. I'm guessing there's also a way if you're looking for them that um, James and LJ can get it out to you as well. All right, beautiful. Thank you, Jen.